the terrible condition of our soils. I mean, for the state of Oklahoma to say that for every pound of wheat you buy from Oklahoma, uh, Oklahoma loses three pounds of topsoil. I was like, <laughs> like, what are you saying? What you're saying is that you know, you're farming to a dead end. You know, you're farming your soil to oblivion. You know, and so um, it's a, it's an amazing po point in time, David. I mean, it's all coming out, and it's going to come out more and more and more. We're going to really see, you know, our past, you know, our heritage. Um, we're going to see things that we assumed were okay or, or, or mostly okay that are not okay, and especially with this with respect to food. Welcome to the Real Organic Podcast. I'm Lindley Dixon, co director of the Real Organic Project. We're a grassroots, farmer-led movement with an add-on organic food label to distinguish soil-grown crops and pasture-raised livestock under the organic seal. You just heard from author and activist Paul Hawken, whose most recent book, Regeneration, offers focused actions for each of us to take to mitigate climate change, all organized by our current work and lifestyle. Whether you rent or own, live in the city or country, work or go to school, or own a business, Paul has advice for you to play your part in restoring health to Mother Earth and her cycles. So let's dive in and listen to Dave Chapman's interview with Paul Hawken. Welcome to the Real Organic Podcast, and I'm speaking today with my good friend, Paul Hawken. Um, and Paul, thank you for coming back and speaking again. I know that your life is very busy because your book just came out, Regeneration, and uh, wonderful event. I'm, I'm so happy. How's I, that going? Yeah, I mean, you know, I am being interviewed and podcasted a lot, but I'd rather be interviewed by you than anything else. And so thank you so much for inviting me and thank you so much for uh, everything you do. It's just, to me, it's like uh, the North Star, the North, you know, it's like, okay, I point North when I point to you, you know. <laughs> well, thank you. Um, I, I, I really would like to talk about the book, but before that, I wanted to check in. You know, there have been some uh, uh, kind of amazing things happening in, in the world of organic uh, farming. Specifically, I'm thinking of the horizon drop of the New England farmers. And um, we had talked in the past about Emmanuel uh, Faber, the, the now former CEO. And I think, you know, when, when I heard that, that Horizon was dropping 89 farms in, in Vermont and New Hampshire and New York and Maine, I was, I was astonished and I, I thought I had heard such good things about what, what um, Danone was doing as a B Corp. And this seems so completely contradictory to everything that I'd read about and everything I'd, I'd heard from him. He's a pretty amazing speaker. And then I discovered that he had been dismissed this spring. So it, this all is such a microcosm for so many things in your book, but could we talk about that? Like, do you think that it is possible for a multinational like Danone to be a B Corp and mean it and stay with it? That's a very good question because it seemed like Danone went from a B Corp to a business corp. In other words, <laughs> And B was meant to be alternative, you know, like a B Corps is alternate, different, you know, distinguished, you know, and vetted. Um, and what we're seeing with uh, the known in the absence of Faber is capital taking over. Because really, when you look at the, the press releases about his dismissal and replacement, it was about growth and money. It was about cost and growth. It wasn't about ethics, integrity, or, you know, quality or anything about customer satisfaction. There was nothing about that. It was exactly about one thing, which is capital formation. And, and so 
I don't know, you know, I question, I, I wonder if the, the juggernaut of capital, it's, um, it, it, I mean, it was, does it have a life of its own? Is it an entity unto itself in which we are, you know, the slaves to, and, you know, we are basically enablers, you know, of capital to grow. Um, <clears throat> and I think we are in that really wonderful, but so long and dense, unreadable book, Capital by, uh, by Piketty, Thomas Piketty, the French economist, you know, he makes it very clear that sometime in the 19th century that capital, um, financial capital, and productivity parted ways. And it used to be the, the rise in productivity that was definitely um, brought about uh, by industrialization. That is, people become 10, 20, 30, 40 times more productive, depending on what they were doing, but certainly in textiles and many other areas, uh, due to the advent of fossil fuels and machinery and technology. And as productivity went up, you know, that is to say, then that was a real increase in quote, quote, value. Uh, a person could create more value, you know, for a society, so to speak. And um, so incomes went up and as incomes went up, then people spent more and then you had this, you know, seemingly virtuous circle, you know, of more money creating more productivity, more, more productivity, creating more money, higher income, you know, and so forth. And, um, but, what he says capital took off on its own, which is that it was more interest, it doesn't exist, but capital was seen as a thing unto itself. And therefore, as it grew, as it accumulated, as it concentrated, um, then it kept looking around for where could it get the highest and best return, safe for some people, not more speculative for other types of investors or banks or financial institutions. And to me, what we've seen is a tremendous acceleration of that uh, since World War II, then since the 70s, since uh, the 2008 debacle um, in real estate here in the United States. And then something happened with the pandemic where it accelerated even further. So we're seeing this tremendous pressure uh, on capital. And we have to understand that, you know, the new CEO Danone answers to people who actually don't own the capital. They are, they mine the capital, they manage the capital, their job, whether it's UBS or, you know, Credit Suisse or JP Morgan or, you know, go on and on or pension funds or whatever. Their factotums, they, they actually, it's not their money. They get paid for managing money. They get paid and incentivized for managing it well. But so now you have this strange system where you have the CEO who doesn't really own Danone, he's not the founder, uh, is brought in to create capital, and then you have people who are hired by big pools of capital to increase capital. And so this is the conversation that's going on. And so you have this withdrawal of uh, Horizon from 89 Vermont farmers is like, capital doesn't know, doesn't care, doesn't see, doesn't understand, and it's obviously, expressed by a human being, you know, by not by the CEO, but by some CFO and somebody under her or him, you know. But the fact is that, you know, capital is a world unto its own. And so it is the veritable bull in the, you know, China shop, you know, which is it moves, it twitches, and then people's lives are badly impacted and they suffer. Yeah. You know, I'm reminded of something that Fred Kirshenman said on stage once when somebody in the audience asked him, well, you know, what would you do if you were the Secretary of Agriculture? And he said, well, I guess that all depends on how long I wanted to remain Secretary of Agriculture. <laughs> you know, which is to say, in the end, it's not even personal. It's like you say, capital has a, a life of its own and... Um, if someone isn't serving it, and Faber was not serving uh, capital acquisition, he, his intention was that this would actually be profitable for the company. And he believed because shareholders would respond and because ultimately customers would respond and because people, talented people would want to work for that kind of company, that this was going to work out well and that they would do well and do good at the same time. But the moment 
that the stock price stumbled just a little bit, some some shareholders jumped in and said, get rid of this guy. Or as a friend of mine said, you know, we're losing money, fire the hippies. And, um, and that seems to be what happened. It does. And it's interesting because they, in one report I read that they compared themselves to say Nestle, you know, which is the biggest food company in the world. Danone is about 25%, I think, of the size of Nestle, but still is one of the biggest food companies in the world as well. And, um, and therefore, you know, Nestle is growing. Um, but it's interesting that Mark Schneider, who is the CEO of Nestle, um, is taking a different approach. And, and, and that is, they're seeing themselves, I shouldn't speak on behalf, but I've heard him say this, so, you know, I'll, I will, as a nutrition company. Now, when they were a nutrition company 20 years ago, um, they got into big trouble because it was baby formula in Africa and this an amazing marketing, you know, that was done to, basically entice mothers not to breastfeed you know i mean it was scandalous and they know that and now of course and they keep paying their dues for that one that was you know 20 years ago and and then some and um it was awkward completely um ridiculous um you know what they did and so forth but they've gone to a couple of CEOs since then. And the latest one, Mark Snyder, came from the healthcare industry. And it's interesting that in a conversation I had with him, you know, I said, you know, that actually the way I look at the healthcare industry in America is the sick care industry because you have to be sick to use it. It's really not about creating health. It's about basically allopathic medicine, which is creating a pharmacy pharmacological industry that's huge and um and i said now because you're going to nutrition and they're going into what they call ancient ingredients that is to say adaptogens ancient nutrition so they're looking not to neo foods you know impossible burgers and you know trying to do something in the lab to create nutrition you know but actually going back to the earth that is like soil earth um, tradition, understanding, you know, Ayurvedic, Chinese, you know, uh, TCM and, and those kind of things, you know, for uh, pathways to uh, true nourishment. I want to take a, uh, nutrition is kind of a funny word, but nourishment, you know, uh, nurturing, nur nourishing the organism. And what they're doing is selling off um, the stuff that got accumulated, you know, like the plastic water bottle company, it's still called Nestle Water, but they don't own it, they sold it. Um, they're selling off, you know, the candy bars, you know, because they were a big, basically, candy company as well. Um, and uh, Butterfingers and Babe Ruth and these kind of things, the brands they own and so forth. And they're, they're, they're acquiring a few companies, but what they're doing is they have um, made a commitment to um, reducing their emissions to have net zero by 2040. And I could be wrong, it could be 2045, but right in there, in the, well before 2050. And so when they looked at what was causing their emissions, the 64% of it was actually food, farming. And I go, well, if we're serious about this, and they are, then what do we do? And it said, we have to look at our farming practices and so forth. So two weeks ago, they announced that they, um, and I'm not sure what the right verb is, but they are, because it's not converting, because they're not the farmer, but they have in their supply chain a, a million farmers. And most of them, I mean, at least I think uh, more than 600,000 are small holders. Exactly the kind of farms in, we're talking about in Vermont. 600,000 smallholders. And that's primarily in cacao and coffee for sure. And some of those farmer relationships go back five generations. Same farm. I mean, obviously, you know, descendants, but nevertheless, and those relationships are deeply bound into the culture and of the company. 
you know, and it's um, enjoyment, uh, if you call that the right word, but I mean, uh, you know, being the biggest food company in the world, biggest chocolate, biggest coffee, etc. And <clears throat> so they are, they are changing all their farms to regenerative agriculture. And their motto going forward is generation regeneration, uh, and, which is not dissimilar to my book title, but, but the, what they say though is rather than my way or the highway, which is, you know, within a certain amount of time, if you're not regen, we're not going to buy from you. You know, in other words, which is they're spending, I think it's 1.3 billion euros or one, maybe one and a half billion dollars on a just transition to work with farmers all over their supply chain to figure out how is the best economical, uh, non-disruptive way for those farmers to make a transition from industrial ag to regenerative ag. So this is a very, very different way of looking. Uh, you can be a big company. They're a big company. They don't get much bigger than that. Probably the biggest supply chain in the world besides Walmart. And, but they're looking at it and acting in a very, very different way than is the known. So they are actually mm, increasing the security of their smallholders and working with them to discover with them the new varieties of Arabica coffee, you know, that can withstand greater heat, you know, uh, agroforestry uh, type of um, <clears throat> uh practices that will give the farmers um more revenue you know multiple revenue streams instead of one but that also provide um more um uh shade where needed or more cooling where ne where it's needed because of rising temperatures you know i mean and again it depends on the country the elevation the crop you know the soil type the water, climatic conditions and so forth what is regen ag well the principles we understand but the application is going to be different, you know, from Chile to, you know, to, you know, to Nebraska, you know, to, you know, Cote d'Ivoire, you know, it's not going to be the same. And so they're taking a very nuanced view of it, which is to look at all the different practices and so forth, and then work with actually very the consultants or hiring consultants who understand this all over the world. Um, and to figure out to make this transition. So that's just what Danone didn't do. Danone did the opposite. Basically, they centralized production in Horizon Milk, which is really CAFO milk, uh, confined area feeding operations, um, and then um, got tremendous market share because it said, quote, quote, organic. Uh, it's not organic in the, in, the, in the true sense of the word, of course, and we've talked about that, or you certainly have talked about that. Um, but then, essentially, you know, the suppliers then are reduced to the lowest common denominator of cost, which is the CAFO facility in Texas, which is, you know, importing quote, quote, organic grain from around the world. We don't know where, always where it's coming from. I guess we do if we look at, you know, ship manifest, <laughs> but not from Nebraska, not from Iowa, you know, uh, and, um, or Alberta for that matter, you know, or, you know, Saskatchewan is coming from China and other countries because it's cheaper. And then you have this ridiculous thing where it's cheaper to put it on a boat somewhere, you know, uh, and, and ship it across the ocean and then unload it in Houston, I guess. And then or wherever Houston, that's not a port, Galveston, whatever. <laughs> My geography is getting wonky. But I mean, to unload it, then truck it, you know, to the, the facility, the Horizon Milk facility, you know, and so forth, and then feed it to cows who never see sunshine or grass, and then put it in a, you know, a wax, you know, carton and ship it around the country, and it's cheaper than organic milk in Vermont. No, it's not. It is not cheaper. It's cheap for sure. <laughs> it's not cheaper in the sense it's not less expensive. It's much more expensive, you know than the milk from uh, Vermont. And so that is capital. So because capital doesn't hear, of, doesn't understand externalities. It doesn't, it's, it, it, the metric of money is money. It, and there is no other metric. And people are actually imposing or, or, you know, trying to put more metrics on top of that, of course, and that's wonderful. Um, but I think what you see in Danone is the default mode is money is the measure of money. The value, the, the money of the value of money is money. <laughs> yeah. Do, do, do you think that that, that was, uh, 
there was a battle going on for the heart and soul of that company. I mean, certainly Faber was talking about doing something quite different. And, yeah. And he, he lost. He lost sales level, you know, plateaued for a while, a couple of years, I guess, and uh, r virtually and not quite, but, and that was it. In other words, if you're not growing, you know, then you're not succeeding. Uh, and um, I don't know about costs. I don't know if costs went up, possibly, who knows? I, I, I don't know the books that well. I do know that the board of directors, you know, and you look at the board, you go, well, I don't see any farmers on that board. <laughs> I don't see any, <laughs> you know, I mean, these are suits, you know, whether they're men or women, and their background is as fiduciaries, you know, and fiduciary, it comes with fiduciary responsibility when you're on the board of directors of a publicly held company, um, you have a fiduciary responsibility to um, protect, increase shareholder value. And if you don't do that, then you can actually be sued, you know, as a board. And so every board member knows that. And the difference between, I think, them and say what Ray Anderson did, you know, at Interface. Now he had a board, he was public, but he still controlled the majority of the shares. Ah, and he was the founder. Mm. And so, he had this uh, amazing sort of moral weight. So he, he or the company could go through um, periods where the economy tanked and so did orders and so did sales and so did their profits. Um, but they kept on going and then said, okay, you know. And the, the, the thing about Danone is there's a kind of a meta story here is we think that when something pancakes or collapses, you know, it's the end, oh, screw it up, it's over. But actually when you get those, those, like what they're in right now, which is, you know, less sales or plateaued sales, 25 billion is a lot of money per year, a lot of sales, but that actually it's a, it's a teaching, it's an opening, which is rather than if your purpose is growth. And every time that happened to interface and so forth, uh, they had breakthroughs in terms of cost, technology, design, um, in other words, it, it made the company better, stronger, uh, as opposed to weaker uh, and, and fear-based. And, fear -based. and so Danone went to weaker fear-based idea that somehow this is going to imperil, you know, their ability to capital, uh, to mobilize capital, you know, and, to, and the shares are going down. And the thing about that is, you know, as we well know, you know, I mean, executives are paid by Yes, by cash, by the salary, but their primary primary form of compensation is their stock. And they're issued options um, and when they begin. And then um, their, their payday comes when they leave, you know, or exercise those options before they leave and so forth. And so if the stock doesn't go up in value, then somehow, you know, they actually just ended up with the salary, you know. <laughs> which is four times greater than the average worker, but whatever. And so, um, and so you have this perverse incentive, really, you know, and for every CEO in every public company in the world. Yeah. Um, I want to read something that, that uh, I was so impressed listening to Emmanuel speak. I, I thought, God, I wish I had said that. He said it really well. But... Um, just one little part. He said, we let market forces drive demand, drive supply, and we are hardwired for salt, for fat, for sugar. And the result is there because unlike what Wall Street is trying to tell us, there is no invisible hand. In particular, there is no invisible hand when it comes to do the right or the wrong thing. So eloquent. I mean, yeah. no wonder he got fired. Yeah, I know. Well, I thought he said that back in, I think, 2019. I thought I'm amazed it took them two years to fire him. Yeah. Well, I mean, because he started telling the truth. And that's a dangerous thing to do. We think of, of, of business people as upright and honest. And within the parameters that they understand themselves and their roles, they are often, usually. But that's honest. Being honest is different than being telling the truth. Yeah. It's not the same thing. Yeah. 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 Well, you know, that 
the question of whether the invisible hand can guide us to the place we want to go. It's a, it's a powerful belief. It, it, it is the dominant religion of, of our culture, although it's a religion that is eroding, I think, rapidly these days. Well, yeah, um, I mean, the invisible hand, you know, this mythical hand, if it does exist, is taking us to extinction. So we have to step back and say, well, whose hand is that? <laughs> it's like, yeah. And that's what Piketty's talking about. That invisible hand actually is capital becoming an entity unto its own and uh, to protect itself, to grow, and at the expense of all other things. I mean, basically, we're destroying life and turning into capital. That's what we're doing. That's the economy that we have. That's the economic system we have. That's what's rewarded. Um, it's a take, uh, I think, I, I mean, I coined this term in 93, a take make way system, you know, uh, that's what it is. But the take is life, you know, the take is life in all its manifest forms, whether it be culture or people or place or river or water or oceans or soil. I mean, you just keep going down that list and every ecosystem in the world is being taken. And, um, and everything that lives and thrives within that ecosystem as well. And the relationships between different biomes and ecosystems is being taken. And so, yeah, I mean, uh, this is degeneration, which is why I, you know, I use the term regeneration because we can see that that road ends. That's what every headline, that's what the IPCC sixth assessment was saying. I mean, for scientists to use the word code red, I just can't believe it. Scientists are so cautious, so conservative, so, you know, I mean, for their, protective of their careers and for 2,500 scientists to sign on to basically that this assessment is code red for the world, it's extraordinary, extraordinary. And even more extraordinary is that every country in the world signed on to it. First time any assessment was signed on to by every member of the UN uh, FCC, the UN Framework on Climate Change. And so, I mean, that's where we're going, folks, you know, and, uh, and then for, you know, a company, you know, to sort of keep their, to not look up, I guess, with, with what I said, not look up and not look around you and so forth. Um, is extraordinary. And so the difference between we'll see what happens with Nestle. But I mean, for example, I just because it's a big company and it's visible. Um, we'll see, you know, how that goes, of course. But at least you have to say that this is the, the direction they're going and the way they're going about it is the opposite of Danone. Danone didn't say, let's figure this out. We've got these amazing farmers, not just in Vermont, but in, you know, New York State and, and uh, who really put their lives on the line and producing a fabulous product, you know, and doing it the right way. They're localizing, you know, organic and regenerative food production, you know, in place and so forth. Let's figure this out. This is, you know, let's make sure that they are sustainable, that they're profitable, that these family farms are viable far into the future. What a good idea. Instead of pulling the rug out from underneath them and saying, you know, it doesn't comport to our cost um, targets, you know, for or so-called, you know, ersatz organic milk. Yeah. It, so it seems like such a, a long stretch for publicly held companies to behave that way. And we give so much power to the publicly held companies. Um, I'll read another thing that, that Faber wrote. So the system has reached the limit and we are pushing through these limits. So why don't we stop? We don't because the consumer does not realize. The consumer does not realize because the food system, we have disconnected people from their food. Yeah, I mean, we've disconnected people from everything. We've disconnected from each other, first of all. Like we are radically disconnected, hyper-individuated, extracted as to who we are by social media and Google, Facebook at all. Um, and we completely separated people from nature. That is, they don't understand it. 
what it is. They think it's something else out there that somebody else will take care of. I'm generalizing, of course. Uh, it's not true for everyone. And then we completely fragmented uh, and disconnected nature from itself. You know, and um, and so acidification, um, you know, habitat fragmentation, uh, of course, um, poison, deforestation, I mean, and then, and, and, and we have to understand too, that the deracination of the 5,000 uh, indigenous cultures is also a disconnection of nature from nature. Um, because 82% of the biodiversity is on the lands controlled or, or owned by um, indigenous people, the 5,000 indigenous cultures and so forth. So as we uh, do further incursions into those lands, into those people. Can you say that again? Because that's news to me and that sounded pretty important. I will. Um, the figures are 4 to 5% of the population constitutes the 5,000 indigenous cultures in the world that remain. Um, and 80 to 82%, I've, I've heard figures, but of, of biodiversity uh, is on those lands that they uh, literally control or are the traditional tribal lands of their culture. And to me, th that's not a coincidence, you know. Um, these are people who, like the Ashwa, don't even have a word for nature. Like, nature, what are you talking about? I mean, and so when we say, you and I say with all sincerity, you know, like we're, you know, we're not separate from nature. We just did separate ourselves from nature because of the syntax of the English language, right? Because it's, it's distinctly something else other than us. And we're saying, no, no, we're really, we're nature, you know? And I do say that sometimes, of course, but I mean, the fact is that you have cultures that are so intrinsic to, to life that that distinction doesn't exist. I, I mean, they, they can't, they don't see the, the world that way, you know? And, um, and it's a, our way of seeing the world, which we inherited, you know, from the so-called enlightenment prior to that, and so, you know, the colonist settler way of seeing the world and so forth, um, <clears throat> is just so, so destructive because it separates and others the world into pieces and parts and, uh, and then takes what it needs, you know, and that's what we've done in horrific ways, of course, and so forth. But I, when I go back to those indigenous cultures, if you look at, well, why is that so? And if you look at the language, because they don't, because they were illiterate, illiterate, that is, they didn't have a writing, uh, and we consider them not as intelligent, right? I mean, that we being, you know, a Eurocentric way of looking at the world. And, um, but they had a different way of understanding the world and it was in songs and narratives, in stories. Um, and so you have the Diné, which is the, what we call Navajo, um, having 700 different narratives to describe 700 different insects. Now you tell me, a culture, a place, or somewhere who I can understand and name 700 different insects and so forth, you know. I mean, this is what they had. You have um, a, a basically, I, I would call it observational science, you know. This is the science of place, and the way they developed that observational science is by being there and living there and surviving there and then thriving there. Uh, and creating art and culture and leisure and song and dance uh, and ceremony and much more. And this is a way the understanding was passed on to generations. Uh, Hindu Omaru Ibrahim, who's a Chadian pastoralist who was educated by uh, her mother, very rare thing in, in that time in Chad, maybe st still, uh, but said that the re yes, they look seven generations ahead, no question about it, she said. But the reason we look ahead is because we know what happened seven generations ago. We, we know, we are told, we understand, we have that knowledge. And so if you see yourself as, you know, seven generations prior and seven generations ahead, what you're seeing is that you're part of a continuity of life. 
And so the idea of breaking that continuum is anathema. It's unthinkable. It's, it's who you are. It's who you become. It's who you emerge, what you emerge into and so forth. And so what we've done is flipped it, you know, which is take whatever you want and accumulate it and then make a world that's more, you know, dangerous and the more dangerous it becomes, the more people want to accumulate and, and, and become individuated. And so, that that if you look at that those five thousand cultures and then you start to parse the language itself, that is, what are they saying? And, it, and this this is difficult because we don't have words for their words. So so you can't say, well, what they're saying is this. You know, well, you've taken a language that is metaphorical and tried to make it explicit. Well, metaphor is not explicit. That's why Aristotle said metaphor is genius. It is genius. And so you're taking a language of genius and putting into the English language, which is the most explicit language on the planet. Um, like uh, it has, well, millions of words, but 300,000 operating words. And Japanese has 40,000. The difference is Japanese is an implicit language. You imply the meaning, you don't explicitly say it. Well, the uh, indigenous languages were even different than that and so forth, which is they used um, uh, metaphor and narrative within their verbs, within their language, in order to teach the person who is learning to speak it how to stay and live and thrive there. It was embedded in the language. It's embedded in the songs, you know, in the song lines, you know, of the migratory pathways that were much traveled by Aboriginal people for 30, 40, 50, 60,000 years, I mean, and so forth. And these songs actually told people. Uh, those who understood the songs, when they got to then sing the song, the land would tell them also what the song was, and the song would change. And the song would teach people what to do there, how to leave this place that they had arrived at in a better place than those who came later. And, um, and what to eat and what not to eat. And if you're really starving, you may eat this berry, but, you know, cook it this way because and don't eat it for very long. You know, it's not cool. I mean, this is the song lines. The song lines were basically the teachings of the land expressed to the people, to each other and back through generations for tens of thousands of years. This is unimaginable to us. It's unimaginable that the Mi'kmaq, you know, in Nova Scotia, the First Nations, could go by a, a tree, what maybe Suzanne Samard called a mother tree, a mother tree being this, the big, you know, big tree that was basically feeding its community of other trees and plants. And they go by and they would listen to the wind softening through the branches and then they would name the tree according to the sound. We don't have a language like that where we can listen to the sound of the wind and name the tree, original distinct name for that tree. And then go back five, ten years later, listen to the wind in the tree and determine whether the sound had changed or not according to the name of the tree, which they remembered. It was not written down anywhere. So, so what if what is there out in this world, this extraordinary world, is um, the a time of reconnection. And I'll go back to this thing about disconnection, which is let's reconnect, you know, to each other, to our place, to um, have this humility. You know, we had El Dorado, we had Cortez, we had people looking, you know, for all the gold and silver in the Americas. They knew it was there somewhere, you know and destroying people in the process and finding the silver in Bolivia and, you know, enslaving people and stripping it to Spain and so forth. The gold was in the people, in their minds, in their hearts, in their traditions. And that's where the gold was. And it still is, although many elders have, you know, absolutely passed away and uh, uh, been extirpated. But, you know, and the gold is how to live here on earth. And, and you want to know how to live here on earth, ask the people who've been here the longest and have done it the best. And those are indigenous people. And so, um, but reconnecting to each other in ways that are, we are bizarrely divided and we've always been different. That's okay. But we're bizarrely divided now. Um, in, and that is amplified by an extractive industries called Facebook and Google. And, you know, and so, um, 
we're exploiting ourselves in a way we used to just exploit other people you know that we thought were lesser than us and now we exploit each other <laughs> and so the mind hasn't changed it's just that the target is expanded and so forth so reversing global warming really is about to me it's about <clears throat> knitting this back together it's not like something's going to happen in glasgow you know at the beginning of november that's going to change everything it's not it never has so far uh, it's a great place to meet, you know, but the, the, what changes it is what we do in place. And you go back to Vermont, you go back to those 89 farmers and what they're doing. You look at what it took to make those farms, what they are today, and to produce the quality of product that they have for so long. And, or maybe not so long, some of them are newer farmers. But the point being is that is the healing of the world. And, and to just decapitate it by uh, economic writ, you know, is no different than the kingdoms of yore, you know, where some, you know, mad and, you know, nutbag king you know, would, <laughs> would destroy things and do this and on a whim, you know, and it doesn't look like a whim from the known, but it is a whim. It's the whim of the idea that money uh, has a primacy over all things. You know, you, as you were speaking, I really thought of that Einstein quotation that you can't solve a problem with the same mind that created it. And, you know, as, as we try to imagine with our mind as it is, how could we have a different mind? How could, uh, you know, how could we see things differently? How could we think differently about a problem? And I think that's what you're describing by looking even at language and saying, you know, they didn't have that word. That that's not how they thought. That, the whole concept was quite different. I think that's that's powerful, Paul. Um, to to well, I certainly am reimagining education right now. As like school would be very different if you said, you know, our old way of thinking is actually leading to our destruction. We need to find a new way of thinking. Yeah, it's industrial education. It came out of the yes. industrial age. I mean, Western education. Then it's gone everywhere in the world. And um, So I have a question about that. Industrial education, industrial agriculture. What does that word industrial mean to you? It means raising productivity. It means raising productivity um, by using um, technology, basically, to increase output to increase uh, the amount of production that a human being um, could um, create. Um, and so whether it's a carpenter with, you know, his skill saw or whatever, or whether it's a factory or whether, you know, it's a, a robots or whether now it's AI, all those things are about industrialization. Um, industrialization is really the mechanization of, of uh, textiles is really the first industry in the world uh, in the conventional sense and um, and then that was I mean the UK Britain got wealthy for two reasons uh, uh, one is industrialization and uh, the dominance that they had in the world the other was uh, uh, enslavement you know uh, you know and um, and that's why to this day, I mean, you go to London and go, oh my gosh, you know, Mayfair and all this sort of stuff. I mean, where did all that wealth come from? It came from increasing productivity of people, but not necessarily giving it back to them. I mean, the average textile worker in 1800, um, in the dark, you know, satanic Hobbesian mills, you know, of uh, 19th century England, 1800, say, was making a penny an hour you know, for 12 hour days, you know. Um, in six days, six plus days a week, I think. And uh, if the woman would make a half a penny, a penny, and the children would make a quarter of a penny. And, and usually families had to all work, uh, the children, uh, husband and wife, uh, in order to get by. In other words, they, they couldn't survive unless they all worked in the mill. Well, there wasn't much time to do much else if you're working 12 hours a day. And they were dangerous um, as well. and. Um, the we know because it was on a, a gold silver standard that what the um, what a penny in eighteen hundred is worth today in in constant dollars it's worth thirty five cents 
So they were getting 35 cents an hour in 1800. Today, if you look at the garment industry in Bangladesh, you know, in countries all over the world and so forth, you know, the average wage of a garment worker is 35 cents an hour. So in 221 years, um, there has been no change at all in wages. And this is what I mean about productivity has gone up, no question about it, you know, but some of it is handwork and so you only, you know, there's limits there. But you look at Vogue and fashion and designers and Keering and these companies of, you know, Keering what is worth $200 billion market value and, you know, so from all that 35 cents an hour work that's going on in the world and so forth, you have these fabulous fortunes now, you know, based on um, uh, fashion and also fast fashion, you know, which is just a perversion. So, um, yeah, I mean, I just felt like, you know, what happened in the pandemic, I guess, you know, I mean, we obviously isolated, we, everything changed in many ways, our habits or patterns, you know, where we, what we did, go to work, not to work, whatever. But I think something with the George Floyd murders and other things, but there was, even without that, but I think that was very, very pivotal in itself. I think that, that there's, there's just something, the layers are falling off, layers of perception, layers of understanding of our past, you know, and the, the, uh, uh, not just the racism, but the, 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 the exploitation of each other in the world in such a heinous way that has been carried forward for decades and decades and decades in a way that was almost seen as innocent, you know, oh, you know, stock markets crashed or this happened or sometimes workers weren't treated fairly and there was toxins, you know, and there's all these exceptions, you know, as if those were the exceptions. But the, there is no exception to the fact that you know, our economic systems are completely degenerative and the, and, and, and the world shows it, the headlines show it, human health shows it, or the lack of human health. Um, the, you know, the, the, the terrible condition of our soils. I mean, for the state of Oklahoma to say that for every pound of wheat you buy from Oklahoma, uh, Oklahoma loses three pounds of topsoil. It's like, like, what are you saying? What you're saying is that you know you're farming to a dead end. You know you're farming your soil to oblivion. You know, and so um, it's a, it's an amazing point point in time, David. I mean, it's all coming out, and it's going to come out more and more and more. We're going to really see, you know, our past, you know, our heritage. Um, we're going to see things that we assumed were okay or, or, or mostly okay that are not okay. And especially with this with respect to food. Uh, I don't know if we spoke about this prior to, um, but I mean, Pepsi, you know, using renewable energy to make soft drinks. And they're the biggest trucking fleet in the world. Biggest, bigger than FedEx and DHL. Uh, 90 plus percent of everything that's on the truck is ultra processed food and soft drinks, Mountain Dew, 7-Up, Pepsi, Doritos, Cheetos, Lay's, potato chips. I mean, this is what's going out every day on the biggest trucking fleet in the world. And 60% of American food is ultra processed, uh, which means high and, you know, what Faber said and, you know, fat. Uh, salt and sugar, which are genetically wire, hardwired into us because it was so hard to get for so long for Homo sapiens. And so, you know, we get, we're very, <laughs> we like those things. Uh, and, um, and so our taste buds were biohacked, you know, by the food industry, by food chemists. And so basically now ultra processed food, I don't call it ultra processed food. I call it a chemistry experiment, you know and uh, on human beings and then who benefits the most pharma because it treats metabolic disease which is caused by what we eat and drink with pills you know pharmacological uh, substances toxins let's be real that you need to take every day god forbid you get healthy that would be a disaster for pharma pharmacy let's make sure that you never get healthy and you stay yeah. sick 
enough to be alive to be a customer. This is the industry. Now, they do good things, don't get me wrong, there's things that they do. But then that's what they put out to you. But underneath of that is a mindset that doesn't go back to the fact that our food is basically demineralized, you know, that it's not nutrient dense, which it was once was. And so if you don't have healthy soil, you don't have healthy people, you don't have healthy animals. Uh, if you don't eat the animals, that's fine. If you do, that's not fine if the animals are not healthy. And, uh, but definitely important in terms of our cereal crops or nuts, seeds or vegetables or fruits. And then you don't have people who have what the earth is there and affords and gives us and has given us for hundreds and hundreds of thousands of years which is um, nourishment. And so we denourish, which is another form of deracination. And um, getting rid of the root deracination, that you're, you're cutting the roots off. And we're, we've, we've deracinated ourselves. And, um, and we spend 20%, 20 cents on every dollar uh, in America, and GDP is spent on pharma, on health, on our sick care system. You know, it's like with the, one of the worst health outcomes in the world. So here's this, this is a system we inhabit, you know. And again, I'll go back to Danone because, you know, they're, they're definitely a poster child right now for, <laughs> for like, what are you doing? What are you thinking? Uh, is that where you have this, you know, expression of connection, you know, to earth and to quality and to food and to people and to culture because those farmers aren't just farmers, you know, they're part of communities and if we, if, if, if anything, any way, one way to look at regenerative agriculture is to change soil from, uh, from dirt back to a community, is to take, you know, a, a basically a medium which we've created by industrial agriculture, you know, by taking the life out of the soil and then to bring it back. And what we know at bringing the soil back to life is, is recreating the community that's there of the microorganisms. And so these farmers are part of communities. Communities are really, the the basis of culture the basis of of health or ill health if the case may be when the communities are divided separated smashed you know and and and, and taken apart by uh, forces that are external to the community and that's what's going on yeah i i have a question you you've touched on it but i think it's such an important one paul you you make very clear in regeneration and in my conversations with you that social justice, racial justice, isn't just, they're not just important, they're an integral part of healing the climate of the planet. Now, I think this is really important, but I don't think everybody understands. I hope they read your book and maybe they'll understand better, but could you take a shot at that? Sure, I mean, Let's look at some other abstraction, which is our body. What's the most important part of your body? Okay. It's all important. It's all important, right? And um, so you can say, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to really take care of my kidney, but screw my pancreas. <laughs> it's like, it's like <laughs> you know, I mean... It gets so absurd, right? When you think of the systems of the body, you know, it's one, it's one system. And the thing about the human being is you can lose an ear, you can lose an eye, you can lose a kidney. I mean, you know, that's resilience. We have, we can't mistake resilience from, uh, from it, that it's still a system, you know, and the system can heal and repair and adapt in, in certain ways to a certain, you can lose one, one part of your lung, but you can't lose the other one too, you know. And so you still have the functionality of that and so forth. So, um, so the idea that we can treat each other as other, that they're expendable people or that they're people that don't count or don't have value um, is the mindset that's causing global warming. We are othering the earth, we're othering rivers, oceans, forests, soil, creatures. Uh, and say, well, we can, this is expendable. This is expendable. And we are not expendable. We need each other. And that sense of fairness and equity and honoring, really, it's honoring other is the fundamental act 
of healing the world because right now we're stealing it. We're stealing the future. And, you know, I say, if you want to understand poverty, there's no poor people. There's people living in poverty. There's a real difference. Oh, those are poor people. No, they're not. Just that term is incorrect. Um, but if you want to understand why they're poor, then go upstream and see who's benefiting. Because there isn't, there's no such thing as a poor person where somebody else is benefiting from their poverty. So we look at it as like, oh, you screwed up, you didn't do well, you could do well if you took this course, if you, you know, <laughs> bettered yourself, if you had any, you know. I mean, then we, we, we take those examples of people who have risen out of poverty and say, see, they did it, you know, and you can do it too. You know, it's a very Republican thing to do. Um, instead of looking at, the, at, 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 at who we are to each other and so forth. So, yeah, I mean, it, it's just, it's systems dynamics 101, really, is that we're here together. And um, in, uh, our future depends on each other. And, and so that's not going to happen unless there's respect, you know. And, and it, it, people, all of us want purpose. We want meaning. We want to be treated with dignity, to feel that we have dignity in our lives, you know. And when we don't, um, we act it out. We can act it out. We will, you know. It can be frustration. It can be self-negation. It can be addiction. It can be uh, all sorts of ways in which we act that out, which is destructive um, and uh, to self and other. And so, that again, that, that disconnected disconnection from each other is, you know, uh, a primary this, this this connection overall is a primary cause of global warming and um as i said you know i mean we're being homeschooled by the planet and here are the lessons you know and george floyd i think is a martyr in that sense in the traditional catholic way of thinking i was raised a catholic um altar boy uh so i know a lot about guilt and but i think he is a martyr in that sense uh almost like a bodhisattvic sense, you know, in Buddhism, you know, like his, what, his death. And I have to say the woman who just stood there for nine minutes, you know, and videoed it, she is something else, you know, uh, in, without which we would not, it would just be another, you know, bad thing that happened between police and a black person. But that, the, the, what's happening, you know, is this a, a, awakening, you know, to, in in the world right now, and um, it's an inflection point. I do think we're at an inflection point. Now, where that goes is to be determined by our actions, but it very much calls forth the, a sense of reconnecting um, to each other, to our places, to where we live. People ask me sometimes, you know. Well, what's the one thing, you know, so, well, what, what, uh, one thing I should do about, you know, global warming, you know, and I'd say, I'd say, you probably won't think this is the right answer, but I think it is. And they well, what is it? What is it? What is it? I said, find out where you live. Because you probably don't know where you live. I said, well, yeah, I live. I said, not your address, not your home, not the name of the city. Where do you live? I live on the unceded lands of the coastal Miwok people. I know that, right? And so, how many native birds can you identify? What soil types is your garden or your farm? Or, you know, and farmers usually, usually know that, but you know, what are the soil types? You, can you name them? You know, can you name the, 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 the non-migratory birds? You know, how many native plants can you name? You know, how many edible plants can you name within you know, a thousand yards of your home and so forth. How, I mean, in other words, where do you live? And you don't know where you live. And so the reason for that is not to be a botanist, you know, um, or a soil ecologist, something like that. The reason is to discover awe and wonder in nature. Because the more you find out about where, where you live, the more you will be surprised you know and delighted it's like wow who knew and then when you discover i remember reading monica galliano and and uh and some other Italian scientists were the ones who really discovered 
plant perception, plant intelligence, some people call it, some scientists hate that term, but whatever you want to call it, that is that, you know, trees have and plants have all five of our senses and 15 more that we don't have. And like they have 20 senses, we have five. And they say, well, why? Because they don't move. So they need different ways to survive than we do. We move around, we're mobile. And, uh, and they actually can see in a kind of chiaroscuro way, they can see motion. They, ha they don't have eyes like we have, they have sensors, these cells on their bark, on their branches, on their bracts, on their needles and so forth. They can see this sort of uh, movement. You know, and I have 40 redwood trees right there. I'm looking at them right now. And, and a pathway that I built out of um, wood from the land that was thinning. So I built this path of manzanita and, and you walk along it to where the bicycle or the car is. And I read that and I was going, I was just so blown away by this idea of plant perception. And then I walked along that pathway and I realized, whoa, all these trees are looking at me, see me moving. <laughs> it was like, oh my gosh, you know, I never thought of it that way. I say, I look at them, I appreciate them. They're beautiful. They're redwoods, you know, they're uh, native to this land, you know. And so is that about where you live, you know, where you live is, uh, is, is uh, either is or was a miracle. <laughs> and, and to find out, what those miracles are, what those extraordinary attributes are, you know, how fast does a humming, the male hummingbird go down to impress the female when it goes up in the air at 60 miles an hour? <laughs> Why? And do hummingbirds, which we have a lot of them here, you know, how do they sleep at night? Upside down, you know, they get so cold, they can't even stay upright on their limb, you know, the little twigs, you know, they're upside down. How do they fly again if they're so cold, they wait to get defrosted or warm up again and then they let go and they fall and then their wings take for, I mean, you know, when you look at the life cycle of a hummingbird, it's two years and then you just like, it's just, it's, it's impossible to comprehend that that even exists, you know, in such a beautiful, beautiful way and the migratory patterns and when they come and when they go and all that sort of stuff. Just saying, I know most people won't do it, but but if you want to do something, the most important is to find out where you live and how it works. And uh, then I think you can have appreciation that climate change is perfect. What I mean by perfect is that it can't be anything other. Nature never makes a mistake. The climate is responding to what we call the biosphere, you know, in the atmosphere. But they're the same thing. Those are two words for gas and solid but they're indistinguishable, just like we are gases and solids. You know, we breathe in gases, we exhale gases, and those gases become material, blood <clears throat> and tissue uh, uh, and food. Uh, and besides that, creates this form, you know, but our system is made of gas and material, and so is the earth, and it's one system. And so, climate is simply an expression of what we're doing in the biosphere, what we're doing down here, you know. And I was talking to Darren Olean, who has that Netflix series called Down to Earth, and I said, you got it right, brother. It is down to, let's get down to earth, you know, which is, this is where the mistakes are being made, made not by nature. And to see climate as something we have to fight, tackle, and combat is, again, that sort of othering thing that we do to people and ethnicities and cultures and races and religions and, and uh, separating it from us and then looking at it as if the climate is wrong. And the, it is not wrong. It is perfect. And the thing is that it is definitely changed, you know, because of warming. You know, warming changes the jet streams and the ocean currents and changes uh, the, the climate which changes weather and the weather is disruptive to this long period of stability. But so is that Mother Earth, the planet homeschooling is saying, you know, how is this working for you? <laughs> it's like, <laughs> it's like, you know, I, I, I've been trying to tell you, you know, I'm anthropomorphizing, you know, the planet. I shouldn't be, but it's sort of been trying, I'm giving these, you know, nudging you, nudge, nudge, nudge these lessons, these hints, you know, you're, oh, you've ignored it. We'll try this one. Hmm, how, let's do a Hurricane Ida this year, you know, and see what that did for you. You know, more rain in New Jersey than Louisiana from a hurricane. Fascinating. You know, like, I mean, it's, 
this 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 um, beautiful dynamic of the earth, the atmosphere, and the biosphere, and climate, and weather, and oceans, and so forth is so extraordinary. And we need to see that in the same way we see a hummingbird, you know, or in 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 which is like, how does it work? And isn't that amazing? And so beautiful. And we're we're the beneficiaries of that in every single possible way you can imagine, you know. And our life is short, and so why not be here? and honor and enjoy this thing that we call life as opposed to fighting it tooth and nail every step of the way and that's just what we're doing and so that's why i think regeneration you know reversing global warming actually is a is an offering to the world it's a gift you know it's something like here try this you know and uh and because if you want to keep going the way you're going that's your choice but it's not very satisfying Paul, I, we're way past what I promised we would be. So um, thank you so much. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to end this here. I, I want to, because I haven't even said it, I want to say the name of the new book that's just come out. It's called Regeneration, Ending the Climate Crisis in One Generation. And uh, it's a very important book. Um, and it's a continuation of this conversation. I feel like we could talk for days and it would be a good time. But um, so I encourage people to to go find this book and, and get a copy and then give it to a friend. Thank you so much. Apparently people are. Uh, it, it, this sounds self, I don't know, selfish or whatever, but it, it was number six in the New York Times this first week. And I, I think that speaks in the in number 10 in the Washington Post. I. Th- I think what it speaks to is a hunger out there. There's a there there, there is a real hunger out there, uh, not for a Paul Hawken book, for a book that really describes how people can get engaged and make a difference and feel like they're making a difference in their life. It is fundamentally a how-to book. It is not uh, about regeneration. It is just as a concept. It's not a concept. It's innate to us. And what it's about is really the book, I call it a neurotransmitter, and the last eight pages is a wormhole, and the wormhole goes to the website. The most important part of the book is the website, not the book. And you can skip the book, you don't have to buy it if you don't want to, but the website is the most complete uh, listing and network of climate solutions, and most importantly, how to get them done. How to get them done. And we don't tell you how to get them done. The world is telling us. And so we have hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of links, you know, to people who are doing it, to organizations, to teachings, to journals, to um, classes, to books, to articles, to organizations, to policymakers, uh, also to bad actors and saying, you know, hey, you might want to talk to JBS, you know, about uh, what they're doing to the Amazon, you know, indirectly by buying soy from the Amazon, you know, and deforestation. Here's the name of the CEO. Here's his phone number. Here's his email address. So we talk <laughs> access so you can influence and speak out, you know, and we'll put in the, the known in there too. And we can change it all the time. It's called Nexus. And this is where you go, you know, to find out how to be effective in, in degraded land restoration. You want to restore degraded land. Okay, here it is. We know how to do all these things, David. We really know how to move from stealing the future to healing the future. And people are doing it all over the world. Regeneration is a burgeoning movement. You know, we're not announcing it. We're not naming it at all. What we're saying is holding a mirror up to the world and saying, it's amazing what's happening out there. Is it sufficient? And no, of course not. Enter the task at hand, no. But it's growing. It's growing faster than what is harming the world. And so we'll see how it sorts out. But if you want to be a part of that, and, uh, and not that you aren't already in some in, uh, way or sundry ways, but amplify that, then that's really what regeneration is about. As I said, the book, it was fun to create, fun to write, fun to... Um, it's got 7,262 citations, so which are on the website when we get them done. But I mean, it's so it's fact-based, but the facts are they're like a floor to tell the stories. And stories are what change us and our minds and our beliefs and our sensibility of who we are and why we're here. And so it's meant to tell stories about how amazing this world is and how 
many ways in which we can um, be truly humane people to each other and the living world. Thank you, Paul. <laughs> Thank you, David. That was great. Thank you for listening to The Real Organic Podcast. We hope that you will subscribe, tell your friends, and leave us a rating and review. A video version of this interview, as well as the full transcript with links related to our conversation, is found at realorganicproject.org forward slash episode 56. Please join us next time when our guest is Kevin Engelbert of Engelbert Farms, likely the very first certified organic dairy farm in the United States, certified back in 1984. To find a real organic farm near you, visit realorganicproject.org forward slash farms. See you next time.